Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this week's Friday Learn in Your Lunchtime webinar. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, Hannes Vessel onto the show. And as everybody who's been part of these will know and is also active in our Facebook group, uh, you'll get these updates and you'll be aware of a lot of the value that uh, you'll be able to get from these. Uh, we have experts uh, come into these sessions. I coach and we get other people to help you with all aspects of studies. Uh, whether it's writing or getting proposals done. In fact, Hannes was busy with a proposal this morning, so uh, we were just having a chat about the studies that he's getting into. Um, but a key topic that comes up so often is, uh, you know, just about your career choice and the direction that you want to go in and the thinking and the planning that you need to do uh, in terms of how your studies is going to translate into a contribution that you make in the workplace and the career choices that you make, uh, obviously, that you need to be passionate about, but that obviously also line up to uh, what you've studied to some degree. So we've had, in actual fact, Kathy Sims uh, last week talking about graduate opportunities. She runs the South African Graduate Employees Association. She talked to us about some of those issues and what she's seeing in the market in South Africa specifically. Um, we also had Melissa Ardendorf uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about mental health, and I think we'll touch on that a little bit today. And in fact, Melissa introduced me to Hannes. So Hannes, um, we're going to dig into you know all these issues around educational psychology mm -hmm. and the great work that you do to help people. And uh, you know, as everybody's sort of coming online, can you guys also um, let us know which university you're from, and then also pop your specific questions onto the chat so that we can uh, answer them in the session and give you some guidance and coaching uh, in real time as we go through the discussion this afternoon. But Hannes, over to you. Give us a little bit of introduction about yourself and, and what you do and uh, you know what you're passionate about and, and possibly how you can help us uh, on the call today. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm an educational psychologist based in Johannesburg and Pretoria. So I have two offices. Um, and what I would say is my, my passions are career counseling or specifically life design and then uh, therapy modality called acceptance commitment therapy or um, acceptance commitment training. So, um, yeah, so those are my big, big, big two passions. But if you can summarize it, it's like um, I love seeing people live up to their full potential and living a rich and meaningful life despite the obstacles that they go through. So everything that I do is guided around that, is helping people just live a fulfilled life um, despite all the obstacles and pain. Yeah. And Hannes, I mean, let's just talk then about student life specifically. What are mm. some of the obstacles that students are likely to be challenged with in terms of finding the right career? I think I sent you a message yesterday of somebody mm. that reached out to me during the week, uh, you know, very worried that they're perhaps mm. in their third year of a certain degree. And is that limiting them in terms of their career choices? So let's just dive straight in. I mean, how, mm. how do you help students, you know, that have these issues, maybe pressure from family, pressures mm. of getting a job, uh, perhaps gone into a degree where they think there's no opportunities in the marketplace how do you balance mm -hmm. and help people with all these issues yeah so uh, if we look at the causes firstly so th there are so many causes to to feeling stuck um within your career or your studies and stuff it can be fa familial expectations it can be um your own anxieties uh, it can be career knowledge or information and then knowledge about yourself so uh, and what's uh, i have so much empathy for especially for the student population because um, they, there's quite a lot of research behind what we call the quarter life crisis, where a lot of people study and they, they realize, oh, snap, this is not for me. So, and what's very interesting is if you go look at the stats, so for, for everybody that is feeling stuck at the moment um, with, with, with their career or with their studies and stuff, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think only 4% of people, um, uh, students in the UK, end up in the same career after the age of 25. So, and in America, it's 20%. So, it is normal to feel stuck firstly, and it is normal to, to not knowing what you want to do. There's another reason for that is biologically, your brain only, uh, ends its second growth spurt only at the age of 25. So, so theoretically speaking, like they've, they've moved the definition of an adolescent up to the age of 25. So you're still discovering so much about yourself up to the age of 25. So, so don't put too much pressure on yourself if you don't know what you want to do. Um, so... How do I help with that is if you look at making a good career choice, they, they uh, imagine there are two big circles. So I'm going to use my hands to illustrate that. We have the circle of self-knowledge and then we have the circle of the knowledge of the world of work. And what often happens, the reason why people might feel stuck is 
they they have enough knowledge of the world of work, but they don't have enough knowledge of themselves. And then these two don't overlap. And that's where that, that gap and that distance happens. So, so what we need to do often is increase the self-knowledge or increase the career knowledge. And hopefully we can get an overlap where we can say, okay, this is the next step for you to take. Um, there's also a, a lot of reasons why a lot of people actually feel stuck is because we have various career myths. So some of the myths are that you have to find a passion or there's one perfect job out there for me. Or another myth is I'm going to start do, I have to do the same thing for the rest of my life. And uh, that also, that psychological pressure that, that, that has makes a lot of people feel stuck. Um, there's also socioeconomic pressure. So I know a, a lot of my clients come from uh, the households where they might be the first generation student and having that pressure to, to live up to that expectation is also quite, um, quite burdensome sometimes. Um, so I don't, yeah. does, does that answer your question, Peter? But uh, Hannes, thank you. I mean, it's just given me so many questions. We've got a couple mm. on the chat that I'd like to get to. So, guys, please just pop your very specific questions about your own situations mm. and your challenges relating to your degree uh, and your career choices so that we can get into those. But if I take myself as an example, I mean, I studied mechanical engineering. And, uh, you know, I guess that was just because I was interested in taking things apart at home, uh, mm. <laughs> whether it's just my dad's TV or, you know, the, mm. you know, peeking under the bonnet of the car. Uh, but I've ended up in, in IT and I did consulting. And I think, you know, I used what I learned in engineering and applied that to, to large organizations, which are just types exactly, of systems. Yeah. Um, mm. So I really relate to, you know, that quarter life crisis that you mentioned, I mm -hmm. guess, you know, we got the midlife crisis that we also go through. And I just yeah. really support your encouragement to everybody to say, don't don't stress about it. You know, you're going to go through these issues. And it's quite normal if you look at the statistics that you mentioned. Mm. Yeah. And what's, what's um, so if you think about it, if I can give a quick history of career counseling, um, career counseling has gone through through four waves. So if we think about how we look at careers. So the first wave was what we call the test and tell wave. That, that emerged uh, 1910 to about the 1930s and 40s where we started developing the tests, the aptitude tests, the personality tests. The, and the, the framework back then or the, 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 the paradigm back then was we can figure out um, your personality and then we're going to fit you into an environment. So we're going to test you and we're going to tell you what to do. What they assumed back then is that the world of work is going to be stable <laughs> and that there are set roles for set works, so almost like the world is this machine and you need to be a, a, a cog in it or you need to fit into this machine. So if we can figure out what part you are, then you can fit. However, I think we know the world doesn't work like that. The second wave was what we call the test, tell, and then grow, career development. They said we're going to test you, then we're going to tell you what to do. And then we assume that your world of work is going to be stable. You're going to work for the same company for the rest of your life. Uh, so, but yeah, in the late 1990s, we realized that that's not how the world of work works, especially with the internet um, and the fourth industrial revolution that threw everything, um, like, uh, flipped everything around. So now we, what we look at actually, and this is the, the paradigms that, that I specialize in, is what we call career construction, or the, the better name would be life design counseling. So instead of saying that there's one perfect job for you and then we fit you into a role, we actually say is your, your career and your, your job, or whatever you do, is actually a platform to something. So what we figure out is what is this ideal life? Uh, what is your ideal life? What really makes you tick? What is your true north? And then we reverse engineer it to say is what platforms enable me to move in this direction? And uh, so, so, but we don't throw the other two away though. So we still use that data of the, the tests and stuff, but it's not the only data. And then now the fourth wave, which all the research is going into is what we call career adaptability. We're saying it is actually futile to tell people that you fit only into this career because the world of work changes so quickly. So even if you found the perfect job, the chances of it being redundant due to AI or something is very high. So what we focus on is on what are these mental skills um, with in yourself and within your system that we can help you keep adaptable in that sense. So, so from yeah, so from that, look at your career as a platform to enable you to to get to something or to update a skill set to enable more of what you want in life. I love that. It's a, it's a stepping stone and you sort of take what you can from one stage to the next. And those mm. stages of lives, I think, you know, generationally uh, mm. for our parents and our grandparents you know we're a lot longer but now those cycles of change that are coming at us in the world and which we'll have to adapt to be successful in 
are just mm. much shorter and shorter. So if we look at Louise's question on the screen mm. there, and she's actually doing an honours in educational psychology, uh, possibly at University of Pretoria, and she says, worried I won't get into master's. And I'm just reading this up because, you know, I record mm -hmm. this for the podcast as well, so in case people are just listening in uh, to the session, a warm welcome to you as well. And she says, I do mm. not want to teach. Um, any advice for mm. me if I do not get into master's? So just that, that, that thinking about the platform-based approach to a degree to support, you know, future working mm. life. Yeah. So the first thing I'll do is like um, reflect on on your initial reason for wanting to go into psychology. So 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 really, what what are the the things that really make you come alive? And then look at that underlying values there. So for instance, the reason why I entered my journey is also it's like I started off with studying like a, a BA degree, did my master's in it. Then I went into education because I, there was no job prospect for me in that degree. Went into education and then I discovered psychology. And but if I think about a theme that was underlying that was throughout that was actually contribution and helping people. So so being able to contribute and help and then also making a difference. So so try to see what is that underlying theme and um, uh, motivation for studying this degree. And then if you don't get into the masters, ask yourself what other options provide me with a platform for that for now while I still move in this direction. So if you don't get into masters, it doesn't mean that your life is, <laughs> uh, is at a standstill. And unfortunately, I've had a few clients that, that want to go into psychology and they, they are so fused and uh, such a tunnel vision with a view of my life will only start when I get into this or I'll be happy when X happens. And what happens is we, we waste so much time of our journey not to live the life that we want mm. or the contribution. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And you said what makes you come alive and how do you mm. help people really tap into that? Because sometimes, I mean, you have to go quite deep in and you have to mm. remove those layers of the familial pressure and your mirroring of the environment mm. and the pressure to get a job and to earn money, et cetera, which are all the burdens that society mm. place on us. But, you know, bringing yourself alive to the possibilities of what you really want to do. I mean, that must require some fairly deep intervention uh, with people. Mm -hmm. So just Hannes, take us through the process that you, you know, you do offer to people if they need, uh, you know, that level of help. Yeah. So, so um, it's, it's always difficult to discuss these because um, you don't want to border into a therapeutic space when I discuss this. So, so I'm going to have to uh, have some boundaries, but, but basically part of this work is, is what we do is we identify life themes so, and life themes are normally recurring patterns of stuff that, that, that you find rewarding or stuff that just uh, gives you a spark. So it's not necessarily a passion. It's, it's this recurring themes. And certain themes help you and certain themes make you feel stuck. So now, then we try to figure out what is causing this tension. And then we, uh, then, then we look at some behavioral traits. But some cool tricks that you can do, actually, um, for instance, is if you have people that you trust, you can actually ask them and you can WhatsApp them or email them and you can ask them, I want you to tell me a story of the times that you saw me at my best. Uh, so that's one thing that you can do. So, so WhatsApp five people and ask them, please tell me a story of a moment, a specific moment where you saw me come alive or where you saw me at my best. So that is a nice like a data point. Then you can get that five data pieces of information and then you can actually look at the themes. What is overlapping? What are the common words people use? And that might indicate uh, something to you. Uh, another question, I'm trying to think of another question that, that can help a person is, is like the, what we could say is the archaeology question. So for instance, um, you can say, let's imagine there's um, archaeologists 500 years into the future come across your memorial. And they're busy excavating it. And there's a saying on this memorial about the life that you lived what what are some of the common words or the the core themes that you want to, them to say about you that that your family members might have uh, left on you your eulogy or and and th those words are, might resonate to some of a resonate to a value to something a life theme that you want to cultivate more of then you need to say is okay how in my present moment or how in my current situation do i get more of that or what platform at the moment when I need to go study next year or apply for different programs enables more of that for me. 
I love that. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> no, and that's and I just want to come back to Louise's question, um, you know, and really just to give everybody today some some actions that they can take when mm. they come off this call, because you know we're very practical uh, in the student success coach community. And uh, as I mentioned just before we came online, I run a members only Facebook group where people can get that kind of you know community support and interaction mm. with their fellow students, and you know just get the motivation and the encouragement of knowing that they're not alone with some of these issues. But your idea or technique of, you know, just getting in touch with people that you trust and asking them to tell you a story of when they saw you come alive, you know, that's just just so powerful. And maybe Louise, mm -hmm. in just exploring your options, you know, could think about doing that over the weekend. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, to your point, it just it just gives you additional data that helps you yeah. make that 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 decision. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day. And, and, and these, you know, are not life and death decisions. They are mm -hmm. important because in your frame of mind, there, there are those pressures and you don't mm -hmm. want to make the wrong decisions. But life's full of bad decisions at the end of the day. I mean, you and I, we also, we're still making it up as we go along, right? I know, so yeah. we haven't figured it out. Completely. <laughs> so I always say that there's not a right or a wrong decision. There's a functional decision. So what helps you in your situation for now to move forward? That's often the only thing that we can focus on is what can I do now that helps me and the people around me move forward? And you'll find that that helps you a lot because if you think about it also, career is, is quite an abstract concept. We can't touch it. We can't feel it. It's so, and because it's so ambiguous, it, we, we, we place this big burden on this thing, this thing that we can't touch. So well, what is a career actually? It's, it's just... It's the jobs that you do over your lifespan to enable stuff for yourself. <laughs> so, so focus on that enabling things for me. Another way that well, what's very important, because I see most of uh, the, 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 the questions here are about degrees, for instance. So what should I do with my degree? A, a metaphor that I use is to say, see your life and your career as a card game. So you're sitting around a table. So let's say it's poker. You're sitting on a table and you, you so there's different rounds of, of the, the, the poker game. And what you want to do is you ideally, you want to have the best cards in your hand. So that is your skills, your experiences, um, the knowledge that you have. And your degree should be a platform for you to have these, uh, to update your cards. And if it, if you don't see your degree like that, you are going to run, you, you're going to struggle to play the game. You're going to, um, only focus, yeah. So, so basically, it says your degree or skills or courses that you do, or the experience that you gain in life, is a way of rapidly updating these cards that you have, so that you can play the best round that you have. So, so part of that is to say, is in the round that I'm at now at the moment. So, if you're a third year BA law student, what can I do to 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 update these skills uh, to uh, to contribute? They so your degree is not necessarily the piece of paper that you get, uh, there's two ways to look at your degree. Let me put it that I get a piece of paper <laughs> that shows that I did something, or it is actually proof that I have a whole range of cards that I can use to contribute to the, the round that I'm playing. Okay, Hannah. So I just want to build hmm. on that point there that you made and help Suzanne here. And she says, good afternoon, currently third year be a law student and I'm caught between doing criminology mm -hmm. honors or LLB next year. Any advice how I can choose? I think you've given some advice there in terms of the mm -hmm. card game analogy, yeah. which is fantastic. But what I want to ask you, Hannes, is mm -hmm. just from your knowledge of career success that you've seen mm -hmm. uh, specifically related to this field mm -hmm. and without knowing a little bit more around Suzanne's specific situation yeah. and her interests and so on, just mm -hmm. based on what you can see there, Honors in criminology versus LLB, you know, what from mm -hmm. the little that you know about the situation, could you give Suzanne any advice? And Suzanne, I mean, uh, Hannes will share his contact details and I'd really strongly mm -hmm. recommend that you give him a call and maybe take this, you know, into a one-on-one -on -one chat. But for now, Hannes, any mm -hmm. thoughts on Suzanne's sort of dilemma there? Yeah, so, so there's two things that you need to do is firstly try to increase that self-knowledge and then also make sure that you increase the career knowledge to make sure that to see where's the overlap. Uh, so what's important is so use some of the techniques we just did uh, talk about earlier. But what I would encourage you to do is um, 
interviewed two or three people that did the honors in criminology, go interview a few people that did the LLB, um, and then uh, write down their answers and take those values or themes that you might have identified through the self-exploration and create a spreadsheet. And they say, so for instance, if it was my life, my, my four values are uh, VCCA, vitality, connection, contribution, and uh, adventure autonomy. So now what I will do is you create a spreadsheet, um, vitality, um, then the next column would be adventure, uh, and yeah, connection, contribution. And then what you do is you ask yourself then between LLB, criminology, and maybe a few other options as well, give each a rating of five or how much vitality would this enable for me and others, uh, if I can use it as a practical example for myself. Next one is how much autonomy or how much uh, contribution, how much connection would it uh, uh, contribute and so then you can actually give each one a rating to help you make this decision when we also when we make decisions like this i'm not giving you a direct answer about the, the field and i'll tell you now why i do i don't give you direct answers is because the, I, I come with my own biases and i come with my own understandings of the field and it might not be relevant to to your context exam but i'm giving you tools to be able to make this decision so when you make decisions there's two things that you need to to two processes uh, we have these two modes of, of decision-making, intuitive decision-making, and then at the same time, we have um, a rational part of uh, uh, decision-making. So what we need to do is the research is very clear. We engage with the rational part of decision-making first, and then we add some intuition onto it, not vice versa. <laughs> so, so what you want to do is so use that spreadsheet example um, and on my Twitter, I do have a, a quick article there that you, if you just DM me, that I can forward that to you. But what you want to do is you go through this process of getting enough career information and then seeing how does this career match with my values and rate, give each one a rating of zero to five. So five is I'm always going to get this value. One is it's never going to enable that. Also add other things like I want to work outside or inside. I want to work with people, not. So add some of those things in the columns as well and then you have a total score and and hopefully there you'll have one outlying uh, score there that can help you make a decision then afterwards if you're still unsure then you can actually check in with uh, what we call like uh, like the gut decision so you can then say if i think about doing this degree uh, check in with your your mind your heart and your gut and, and see if there's any flags if there's a flag take some time to explore it um, go talk to people or go for professional counseling just to explore then what's going on there. If you get uh, green lights, go ahead. So you've done your spreadsheet and you got the green light, go for it. Um, the other thing is you can ask yourself questions like if my next career decision was a song, what, what name would it be? Or what song would describe it? And, and, and then give it some time until you find that song. And then that might also give you indication. So I would say increase the career information increase the self-information, and then you use this decision-making uh, where you go rational and intuitive together. Thanks, Hannes. That's fantastic. And it sort of reminded me of the chat we had with Kathy Sims a couple of weeks ago. And when you talk about the career knowledge and the mental or, or sort of discussion that you sort of go through in your own mind about your career choices, mm -hmm. the one important point, you know, we had a, a, a chap on the on the webinar and he said, look, he's doing chemical engineering and, you know, he's a little bit worried about job opportunities, et cetera. And Kathy mm. Sims, you know, she knows the marketplace. She said, look, there mm. really aren't jobs out there for chemical engineers. So then we talked about options for him to retain, you know, his passion in chemical engineering, mm. but then use some of the skills that he's learned in the process of getting that degree. Cause as you said, it's just a piece of paper, right? So he's going to say chemical yeah. engineering, but yeah. in that he's done process engineering. He's done, mm design optimization he's done and we listed all the skills that you yes. learn as you go through chemical engineering and i yeah. said listen at first rand where i work a bank we hire process engineers mm. we hire solution designers mm. we hire people with those skills now would you mm. think about a chemical engineer working for a bank but if you were to map the skills versus what a non-traditional chemical engineering firm is mm. actually looking for you know that sort of also starts to open up the the options there uh, and and as you were saying just the career knowledge and the mental uh, analysis yeah. that you'd go through, uh, you know, in assessing your options, uh, you know, with the yeah. degrees that you've got. Exactly. And we can bring it back to that metaphor is in, in the chemical engineering, what did you learn? One of the cards is critical uh, thinking, um, working on project deadlines, working. So, so, so all of those underlying skills as part of this deck of cards that you can actually 
put onto your CV and look for other environments where you can get that. Yeah. So I love the fact that you say, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Is it ever too late to change your career path? Yeah. Let's, let's, you... answer this. Yeah, yeah. let's answer this question. <laughs> Great question. You go, and then I'll go. <laughs> never. I've, I've, seen, I've had clients that are 65. <laughs> so it's never too late. What's very interesting is one of the myths in Korea is one of the careers myths is it's it's not okay to change your career or it's bad to change your career. That's a myth. Your your career is a bartering system. You bring a skill set to a company or to an organization or to a market, and they trade you with resources or, or something. so they trade in exchange for something. That in the modern economy that has a very quick cap. So at the moment we're looking at. The average person changes their job or their career every two to three years, so so it's normal. It's never too late to change, um, especially if you think about it. Just to say, is, I'm at a company to get it to, to trade a certain skill set to get experience and skill set back, and some financial remuneration for that to enable more stuff for me. So um, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Hannes. I mean, uh, yeah, as you say, you can be age 65 and sort of have this pivot, as we spoke about with Kathy mm. Sims a couple of weeks ago, which I think is just such a, a sort of powerful metaphor as well. And as one would in a card game, you know, suddenly you, you're strategizing constantly, whereas, yes. as you say, the, the previous generations of getting into a job for 40 years, get your gold yeah. watch, I mean, that's, that's, that's gone. Um, mm. So from my perspective, yes, I mean, I mentioned mechanical engineering into consulting and then into IT leadership and then into digital transformation. And the most important thing that I leveraged as I went along the way was just the skills that I'd acquired, the cards mm. that I had in my hand um, mm. that life had played me. And I lost some cards along the way and I gained some cards along the way. But, mm. uh, you know, I was, was constantly assessing what those opportunities were. While I think, Hannes, and maybe just an important balance to play as well is not mm. jumping too quickly, you know, sort of settling into a role to develop mm. skills, build up a network, and make sure that my CV is still, you know, so I do feel that, you know, I sort of tell people, you know, try and spend a year in a role. I mean, I think just, mm. just you know, there may be other reasons that you have to leave, but if you can, before you sort of start moving, um, you know, get some depth and, and, and make sure mm. that you've demonstrated to a future employer that you've had a chance to put those skills into practice. Because yeah. you know, my perspective, being in the workplace 25 years, the complexity and the challenges of the modern organization, as you say, because it's changing so quickly, it, it, it takes a while to settle into a role and really start delivering value. Mm. So, 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 mm. so, so that would be the one sort of um, aspect that I would add on to on to that point there. Mm. Guys, I have put uh, Hannes's uh, connect, uh, contact details uh, into the chat there. So uh, more than welcome to to connect with him there on uh, Twitter and get uh, some more insights mm. there. This is a great question here. And, and I see, Hannes, that we've got quite a couple of educational students on the on the webinar yeah, today. Which is I'm curious to see so many educational psychology <laughs> students. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's because we put educational psychology in the Probably, title. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Jessica Van Bilyeun says, good afternoon. Hi, Jessica. It's lovely to have you on the call. It's lovely to have everybody this afternoon. Uh, it's already officially the weekend, guys. So after 12 o'clock on a Friday, it's the weekend. So uh, we can all look forward to, to a little bit of a, a bit of a relaxation the next couple of days. But I do understand people are also studying and doing work. And um, Hannes has got a grant proposal to get in by, by midnight tonight. So we're going to wish him well uh, for doing some work this afternoon. But Jessica says, I'm a first-year education student, and I'm interested in a career path in either educational psychology. So I guess, Hannes, you'd be very well qualified to help her about that <laughs> and be somebody that she might want to interview about what that's like, or remedial teaching. Um, mm. However, I'm not sure which one I'm more interested in. Mm. So the advantage that you have, Jessica, is I think you have four years to decide. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what I would focus on at the moment is to say, um, to use this time to increase your career knowledge, self-knowledge, and get out of your comfort zone. Use this four years to get out of your comfort zone. And I would even encourage you to explore stuff outside of remedial teaching and educational psychology and be very strategic on find stuff that, that you can feel that, um, oh, there's a spark here. There's something about this. And make a list of that. And by the time you get into your third year, then uh, we need to start maybe applying for going into educational psychology or remedial teaching so then you can then you actually have a list to 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 make this decision. So um, yeah, so go interview educational psychologists, go interview remedial teachers, and and see how what they say matches with your own values. 
Um, but regarding, let me think here. Um, also, make sure that you update this card skills while you are studying. That's why I say it's so important to get out of your comfort zone, especially when you're adversity, because you, you have the safe environment where you, you can really try new things. Because these experiences, what we know from researchers, um, people with a proactive career approach tend to have higher success um, in their career and satisfaction. A proactive career approach is somebody that is open on experience, so meaning they like to, to seek out new experiences and they are conscientious, so they are self-disciplined. So use this time to explore those two different options and get to know yourself, so increase both circles until you get that overlap. But at the same time, work on some soft skills like self-discipline, meeting, meeting your deadlines, managing your own, um, your own uh, mental health. Those three skills, if you can master them, it doesn't even matter if you go into education, psychology, or remedial teaching, you will have be satisfied. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And, and Hannes, what I, I just loved what you were saying there about, um, you know, acquire new skills. And, uh, you know, this mm. is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And, uh, you know, as everybody on the call will probably be, be aware of, um, you know, I have a number of uh, courses that I make available to people. And I'm just putting one on the on the chat right now, which is to learn about how to boost your job prospects. And I've also got courses on digital transformation and different mm. career paths like procurement and HR and program management. And this is just drawing from the roles that I played in my career and giving people the insights to go and learn those skills. And as you say, spend the time to gather knowledge, add cards uh, into your deck as you play uh, the game mm. of life. So I put the link on there, and uh, that is a free link, guys, so you can actually enroll there for free uh, for the next uh, three days. And in there, I teach you sort of how to position yourself for the world of work, and then, you know, as you're going through different career choices, how you can uh, just boost your prospects uh, in the working world. So there are uh, quite mm. a few techniques in there that, uh, you know, I think Hannes was mentioning that you might be able to uh, go and uh, have a look at. Um, mm. Yep, and Jessica, comment if, if you think that helps, that advice. <laughs> yeah, no, please, absolutely, yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, absolutely. Please uh, please do let us know how that's going. Um, I uh, just see here, Mariachi, good day. I'd like to ask what I need to do to become an educational psychologist. I'm a first mm. year education student. So here we go again, lots okay. of educational psychologists. Yeah, so, so now I can give you some career information. <laughs> to become a career educational psychologist, you need... Uh, generally speaking, you need two things. You need a degree in education or a PGCE. So you need an education qualification and you need then uh, a, a psychology qualifications or enough credits for psychology education. So, so you either major in psychology and then do a PGCE or you do education and make sure that psychology is a major for you up to your third or fourth year level. Then what you need to do is you need to apply for your educational psychology honours and then for your educational psychology masters. So once you get your masters, you need to do an internship for a year, um, and then you need to apply uh, and write the board exam. And once you pass the board exam, then you qualify to become an educational psychologist. Um, uh, just a, a side note: so for everybody that's interested in studying psychology, it's very, very important to know that the bottleneck happens in your honors and your masters year. So I don't know the exact statistics, but out of everybody that starts studying psychology, only a very few, if you look at every honors or master's group, I think every um, field, so in, in psychology, uh, so in South Africa, we have about four fields, uh, four types of psychologists. So we have research psychologists. So they don't necessarily do therapy, they do the research. We have counseling psychologists, educational psychologists, and uh, clinical psychologists. So there's also quite a lot of stigmas around the three. So, but, but basically, we can all do the same thing, except we specialize um, in, in a little bit more niche innuendo area, area. So, all three can do therapy. All three can work with adults. Um, it's, it's just educational psychologists specialize more in pathology and uh, things that have to do with learning and development over a lifespan. A counseling psychologist um, works more with... Um, enhancing personal functioning so and then a clinical psychologist specializes a little bit more in um for instance uh, more working with pathology but like i said all three uh, can do according to our scope of practices do the same work it's just we have a little bit more innuendos so but all three you require a master's degree at a credit a, a, a creditors institution 
um, and you have to do then an internship and write a board exam in order to pass. So, so make sure that you, you accommodate your plans to know that there's a bottleneck and that you, you, you take it for a fact that there's a low probability of getting into it. So by the time that you get to your honors and your, your masters, what they are looking for is life experiences. They're looking for empathy. They're looking for uh, emotional intelligence. So, so make sure that the time that you have at varsity, that you get out of your comfort zone to learn these skills, the emotional intelligence, the getting life experiences, um, and just maturity and, and make sure that your academic marks are good enough. You need at least an average of 65 and think about how many people applied. So make sure that your marks are uh, up to scratch. Wonderful, Hannes. And there you go, guys. I mean, absolutely uh, wonderful advice from a very experienced educational psychologist. And I think just helpful to get a sense of that um, planning and the bottleneck that you need to anticipate and the marks and the minimum qualifications and expectations. And then I think also, Hannes, just the insight about the three different types of psychologists. I've certainly learned uh, you know, a lot about mm. that now in this uh, conversation. So that's very, uh, very helpful. And then just um, the Mariachi says there, thanks very much, absolute pleasure. And uh, very glad that that was helpful. Uh, this afternoon and uh, we were chatting offline and uh, look guys if you need more help you know we have a mentorship arrangement in the members only Facebook group and we have people there that you can reach out to and I've invited Hannes to, to join us in that group as well I don't know if you're on uh, on Facebook as well Hannes but uh, mm. I put the link into the chat there for everybody that's not yet mm. a member of the group so please do uh, sign up there and then you'll get notified of these events um, and you can also get in touch with me I also provide um, you know free coaching uh, for a 30-minute session, happy to, to, to have a chat and uh, point you in the right direction. And if it's educational psychology, I'm going to point you directly to, uh, to <laughs> Hannes if you need advice on uh, career choices, etc. Uh, I can give you his contact details, which we've already put uh, on, the, on the chat there, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of people just ask us for the three categories, just to remind us. I so, think that was the three categories of psychologists. Uh, educational, clinical, counseling, and then research. Okay. Yeah, so you do you do get uh, at the moment um, they're working on another subspecialization of neuropsychology, but it, it's not a category yet in South Africa. So they're still advocating for a neuropsychologist, but we, we don't have a formal. So you have neuropsychology degrees, but you don't can't necessarily specialize in neuropsychology uh, or become a neuropsychologist in South Africa yet. So we're still working on that. Um, just mm. a side note. Um, so yeah, my my handle is the same on my Twitter and my Instagram and my Facebook account. So it's at Hannes Edsyke for for all the platforms. Yeah, fantastic. I'll I'll add those links in there as well, Hannes. I've done the Twitter awesome. one. Sydney Timber, just building on those categories. Which type of psychology would you recommend? Then she wants to work with children in particular. Yeah, traditionally the 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 the, the, the educational psychologists work more with, with, with children, but you can specialize in working with children in all three fields, clinical, counseling, and educational. So before 1996, the categories um, so were that educational psychologists only work with children, counseling psychologists only work within the counseling scope, and clinical only work with like mental disorders. But that, that, that we, we were way past that um, in the modern era. So you still people uh, have people that have these perceptions. So, um, uh, at, yeah, and say the child psychologist, but we don't have child psychology. We have psychologists that specialize in working with children. Okay, fantastic. Hannes, I've just popped your Instagram handle there as well, uh, mm. just for everybody to, to get maximum access there. Question from uh, Madi Chaba. Hi, I'm doing a BA in humanities. What can I do to be a clinical psychologist? And there's a couple other questions mm. there about talk, people talking about switching. So just let's help mm. Madi Chaba there. Yeah, so I mean, make, make sure that you have uh, majors in your psychology subjects, which includes like uh, social clinical, like pathology and um, like mental disorders and like community work and stuff. So make sure that you have um, psychology majors that, that move to uh, look towards the clinical psychology side. Um, but also, like I said, um, be, uh, be, be aware that there is a bottleneck. So see, so, uh, I know on average, I know from my circles that most people take two or three times to apply. They apply two or three times. Some people apply five years in a row before they get into the clinical psychology program. But in order to get clinical psychology, you need a you need to have a BA, you need to have your degree, then you need to do an honors, a psychology honors, and then you apply for the masters. And you'll find that the, the application process is also quite rigorous. 
So you, uh, most organizations um, and most institutions ask you to submit referee reports. Um, they ask you to submit uh, some sort of CV or something, your academic record. They even ask you to write a research proposal uh, to see the quality of your writing and your academic rigor. So if you have research subjects, please do not fall into that trap of or the, the classroom chatter that says, oh, this is bad or this is useless or your, your research subjects is probably going to be the subject that enables the most of, uh, for you, even in your career afterwards, because that, that framework of thinking, of getting to the truth and making decisions um, and testing hypotheses is actually the most important skill that you can have, even in, as a psychologist. So, Hannes, I just want to really emphasize mm. that point for everybody and make sure that that's that absolutely clear for everyone. So, what you're saying is mm. if there's a research component in your degree, so you're going to go in and do some research on a topic, for example, mm. that topic that you've chosen there could have far-reaching implications or position you as more of an expert in that field because you've done that first-hand research. Um, is, is that what you're saying? I just want to double check. So what, what I'm saying is I've traditionally, like, so I, I also lecture, and w when you talk about stats, for instance, statistics, or you talk about um, any math-related subject or research-related subject, the eyes start rolling immediately. And like, oh, I had it. And, so, and, and there's not a lot of attention in that. But what's very interesting is in your honors and in your master's, yeah, you actually, the big part of your studies is actually a research report. So if you if you don't take the research subjects seriously at varsity, you okay. actually put yourself on the back foot. So part of your application process, they ask you to provide you provide an example of your academic writing. So if you don't okay. take special care in developing that skill, you actually fall behind. So so make sure that that you it's just because I know that there's a bias to, or a, like a a cringe effect when we talk about stats or maths or research. So but that those. Um, and also the framework of thinking. So most of your other psychology subjects is very theory and fact intensive. So you, you just regurgitate facts and theory. Research, however, or your stats actually teach you a framework of thinking that I still use on my daily basis. And I can think, um, Peter, you also use that the critical thinking skills ability to say, is, I have a, a hypothesis about something or an idea about something. How do I get information to see if it's true? Or how do I make a decision about that? That framework um, mm. is, is is crucial in all aspects. So even if you don't go into psychology field, that that mindset, that scientific um, thought paradigm, the scientific paradigm actually enables so much for you. Yeah, the scientific process. I mean, how scientific knowledge process? Is yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Yep. No, no, 100%, yeah. 100%. So Sonia's got a question there. What can you do during the year if you're not selected for master's or honors? I want to do a BSc in human physiology, genetics, mm -hmm and psychology and UCT only accepts seven people a year. Mm. So what I would do is firstly ask yourself in with the greed I already have, what skill sets do I have that are employable? So uh, another thing that we focus on in career counseling is what we call employability. So having physical skill sets that the world of work needs and what these departments need. So if for instance, the human physiology, genetics and psychology uh, uh, it is very research intensive. Go uh, shadow or go work for some marketing research companies, for instance, or go work at places where you, you learn these skills that enhance your employability skills um, for the masters and honors. Um, what's very interesting is some of my previous clients and students that I've helped, they really struggle to get into their masters. The one student actually... Um, she, she, I think she applied five years in a row, and only in the, the fifth year did she get it. But what, what, and I have to give a tap my hats off, so I don't have a permission to share her name. So, but what, what she did is she said, is, I'm not going to wait for the degree to define me. I want to make an impact, and I love um, writing. So what I'm going to do is she started her own Instagram account, and at the moment, I, I checked the other day, she has more, more than six and a half thousand uh, followers at the moment on Instagram. And what she does is she she actually through through her poetry and stuff, she's actually making a very good living for herself. So so what she did is she said, I'm not going to wait for the piece of paper to actually live my life. The piece of paper is actually enable something for me to, to help maybe on a broader scale, but I can still help and I can still make an impact and move people by via other platforms. So so Sonia, why are you doing this? Um, if I could summarize what I said there is work on your own personal brand. 
um, work on employability skills that are relevant to the field while you're waiting for this. Don't sit and wait. Be proactive and, and uh, update the, card, the cards. Fantastic. Appreciate that. Um, and just uh, you were talking there about the importance of um, – learning um, to, uh, you know, write effectively as part of mm. the research process. And just by coincidence, next Friday, um, uh, same time on the YouTube channel right here, and I'll send a notification out to the Members Only Facebook group, um, I'll be giving a, a full hour live coaching webinar on writing skills. And this is a material that I've developed actually over five years of running these workshops at BITS uh, in the postgraduate awesome, yeah. community there. So Hannah's just talking about, um, you know, the, the, the scientific process requires a lot of writing. And this often becomes, as you were saying earlier, you know, to use the term bottleneck, a real challenge for people often, uh, especially if they're not writing in their first language, for example. But, mm. uh, you know, if you can't write, you can't get your thinking and your solutions and your analysis, et cetera, down onto paper to be assessed and um, to, to improve your employability, as you were saying, to, to, mm. to, to get access to those additional roles that your research will um, provide access to. So just to, mm. to let everybody know next week, learn writing skills right here again uh, from 12 to 1. I'll be doing uh, live coaching. Uh, a couple awesome. of questions here as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Hannes. Mm. Um, uh, quick question there from Leandri. When do you foresee neuropsychology becoming a registration category in SA? Just any idea on time frames for that? Sure. I actually have no idea. I think uh, it, it's been ongoing for the last six or seven years. So I actually have no idea. I, I, I'm not involved with those discussions. Hopefully very soon. I, I, I can't see that, <laughs> that they've had all these discussions and it's not getting closer to, to the registration. So, yeah. So, but, but what you can do is if you, neuropsychology is your passion, go into one of the other fields. So educational counseling, um, uh, research and clinical and then specialize in neuropsychology afterwards. So what you can say is I'm an educational psychologist that specializes in neuropsychology. So that, that's one way that you, that, that you can do that. Gee, that's helpful, Hannes. Gee, I think you guys are getting fantastic insights this afternoon. And Dinda says, if I didn't get into honors for biochemistry, but I got the degree, what should I do? Um, so, Andida, you'll need to comment for me is what do you want to do? Why did you get into biochemistry in the first place? Mm. <laughs> so, mm. it's, so, it's uh, and, and what do you want your degree to enable for you? So, the honors, what would you have done more of life in life if you had the honors? So, uh, that's very difficult. So, what you need to look at is what, what do you want your degrees to enable for you? And then, at the same time, to so say, okay, uh, what about the biochemistry? What uh, helps me to get this skill set? And how can I contribute that skill set in other fields? And then focus on employability skills at the moment. Uh, I would encourage everybody to, to get their own website, to start their own uh, social media following, build community around you. Those are skills for the future. So, so work on that already. Um, and often, if we don't get into the stuff, there's pain behind it. But we do believe, and there's a lot of research, it is our pain and our purpose is very, very strongly connected. We, ca we hurt the most where we care the most. So mm. if you didn't get into something that really hurts, ask yourself, what about this hurts and what do I care about? And then get more of that thing that you care about on a daily basis. Great. And Connie's question, similar to that around doing a certificate in sports sciences. So she wants to become a sports development officer. What can I do next after finishing my certificate also has a diploma? So sports management, mm. you know, employability and considerations there? Yeah, so um, I think it's difficult <laughs> in the COVID circumstances at the moment due to the sports being. So let me just look here. Yeah, sports sciences, um, become a sports development officer. What I can do next after finish my certificate. Yeah, so it depends. Is Was your intention to go into sports and the speed fields? So network, guys. So Build that personal brand. Start your own following. Get onto LinkedIn and make sure that you update your LinkedIn profile and start connecting with people in this field. That increases connections and possible job offers or un job hunting. At the same time, um, connect, um, network with people in this field. Um, what's nice though is in the, the modern age, go look at, um, for instance, sports sciences. What you can do is go look at the journal articles of the people that have published in the sports science field, for instance. Go look at who are the thought leaders and opinion leaders. 
and then go stalk them on <laughs> Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and start connecting with them and build rapport with them or build rapport with that community. And that opens doors for you to see what are the opportunities in there. It's very difficult for me to, to know the niches in the fields because uh, so the reason why I, I might be ambiguous sometimes is they there's this old uh, very famous experiment in psychology where they had two computers and two groups of people playing game on a computer. For the first group, they gave them rules and they gave them direct advice and they said, do this. And the game was you have to press space bar. Um, every time that the dot goes over the line, you press space bar and you get a point. For the second group, they said, hey, you have to learn by experience. It's something to do with a keyboard. So obviously, uh, initially, the first group did very well. But then, without them knowing, while they were playing the game, the researchers changed the rules of the game. They changed the context. They changed the situation. I think about how quickly the world of work changes and how mm -hmm. the sports science field changes, for instance. Now, what they did is, because these guys learned by experience, they mm -hmm. actually, with these guys became very rigid, and they kept doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, and they started losing points. They're not even aware of that. So this group actually started very quickly this group excelled uh, at the end compared to this group. So when it comes to life decisions, we have rules and we have um, experiences. So yeah. if you, if anybody's here stuck, so I don't know what to do is learn on your feet, go out, get out of your comfort zone, go network with people in the field, go network with people in other fields, go look for some role models in the field and see what they are doing. What are the skill sets that help them to excel in the field? And then double down on a skill set like that. So if you see a sports scientist or a sports development officer in the field, if you notice that they're very good at connecting with people or they, you notice that they're very good at expressing the ideas, emulate that and, and practice that skill and connect with them and ask them to mentor you to, to help go forward. But, but you, being on your feet and actively involved in your career and proactively seeking out opportunities and information is the best advice there because that's your own learning. It's very uncomfortable in the beginning and you are going to play catch up a little bit with the people that said, do this. But I promise yeah. you in the long run, you're going to be part of, <laughs> I'm getting confused here. <laughs> you're going to be in part of this group. <laughs> that's excelling. <laughs> I, I think, Hannah, it's just a common theme that's coming through what she's saying there is, you know, take action, get out there, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. learn more by doing and experimenting and then with a growth mindset, you know, using that mm -hmm. learning to improve, you know, what you do next time and the opportunities mm -hmm. and the things that you focus on. I've put two courses in the chat and I've just actually opened them up for free to make them available to everybody that's uh, online today. The first one is, and uh, just link to uh, your points around building a brand and building an audience mm -hmm. and you know, getting yourself out there. And it's amazing what you can do with the digital tools that we have available. And those mm. courses, um, the first one is you can launch a podcast in five days and I teach you how to do that uh, with absolutely the simplest and easiest tools to use. Uh, absolutely everything uh, in there is free. Access to the course is free. The tools, et cetera, are all free. There's no licensing or hosting costs. The ability to host a podcast these days um, is actually a lot simpler than it's been uh, in the past few years. So I give you a five-day blueprint and I take you through that process and I challenge you and help you take action every step of the way to get to that point. So maybe, um, you know, Connie doing sports science, you know, why don't you get a podcast going talking about sports mm. development in South Africa? You know, build a brand, just get a voice out there. It's going to take you time to go through the course and sit down, record an episode once a week, interview people, build a name for yourself, get yourself mm. out there. I think this is the type of thing uh, that Hany Hannes has been talking about. Yeah. And then the other course that I mentioned there was, um, you know, how to get your YouTube channel going and uh, how to get your presence on social media going uh, using things like webinars and live streams and the way that I've set up this uh, call today and the way that I run it every Friday. I lay all of that out in an absolute easy to follow blueprint uh, in that course there as well, which I put in the chat, uh, grow your audience on YouTube. And then earlier on in the chat, I put the course, uh, boost your job prospects. And Hannes was talking about, you know, building your LinkedIn profile, updating your CV, networking, mentoring, getting coaching, etc. Mm. And there's some practical techniques and skills and tricks that I provide you in that course, mm. which once again is uh, free for you to uh, enroll in uh, through that link there. Hannes, just a few minutes left. I mean, any sort mm. of my final thoughts? Where can people get hold of you? Um, you know, yeah. if they do need some some help and professional advice and counseling, talk about your, your offerings mm. and, and how people get hold of you, please, Hannes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, you can get a follow me there. So at the moment, I post about three times a day, 
tips, tricks, um, motivation. So, so it is quite an active account. Um, also, my website, hunnersvessels.com. Uh, let me see. I think there's an option to share the screen. Let me just get – I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Yeah, go ahead. I'll also grab a link and pop it on there for everybody. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so there's my website. So you can go there. Um, you can uh, – what do you call it? Um, so if you get started now, you can look at my services. I provide counseling, career counseling, and even like assessments and stuff. So there's the best way if you want to book an appointment. You can call. You can uh, book directly online or you can email me as well. So those are all – so hannesvessels.com. Yeah, I popped it in there. Awesome, yeah. thank you. No, no, that's absolutely fantastic, Hannes. We mm. uh, absolutely, I think, got a huge amount of value uh, from our discussion today. And I just want to make sure that you know everybody's got all your contact details. So I'm just going to mm. pop the uh, Facebook link in there as well uh, for people to go and uh, look you up there. And I'm going to tag you from the, the Student Success Coach Facebook group as well. And uh, you know, awesome. we'd love you to post in there if there's any articles or, or, or things that are relevant. Um, so we can just, you know, uh, cross promote and help each other's audiences. I think, you know, people get mm. so much value when they see the, 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 the value of, of interacting uh, on certain topics mm. that people need um, assistance with there. So Connie, Connie seems to be very excited about some of the topics that we went through uh, this afternoon, uh, which is great news. And, and I do appreciate uh, all the feedback that we've been getting from everybody uh, in the session this afternoon. Mm. Reminder, next week is, uh, as I said, how to write academically, improve your writing. I'll, I'll be teaching you four very practical techniques. Um, we'll go through those in the hour, and you'll leave with practical, actionable uh, tips and tricks to improve your academic writing and get through those important research modules. As we've heard from Hannes today, you know, doing research um, is so important. It's such an important skill, regardless of whichever career uh, you need to get into. Uh, so join us next week for that. And then two weeks from today, we've got um, Clive Batkow. And Clive Batkow is an incredible leader um, in uh, South African business. Uh, he was at Accenture for many years, and he's currently the CEO of Kalon Ventures. But one of his passions has been mentorship uh, in South Africa, and he believes in the importance of um, inspiring and um, encouraging mentors to step up and help people uh, get through, um, you know, whether it's degrees in education or starting business and becoming successful uh, in the environment wherever they are needed. And as everybody knows, we've been promoting a mentorship program in the Members Only Facebook group, and we've currently got, I think, six people that have actually signed up to be mentors uh, in the Facebook group. So we interviewed Cara Demura uh, a couple of months ago, and she's been getting that going. And uh, the connections that have happened there, and, and we'll be speaking about a mentorship and the importance of mentorship, and also hopefully recruiting a few more mentors on the site, because Clive, I would call him a mentor to the mentors. Uh, so he <laughs> will just, you know, he's just got so much uh, experience of decades of being in business. Uh, so don't miss that one uh, in a couple of weeks. But Hannes, uh, thank you very much. I think, you know, people have got so much value from uh, your insights today. Wish you well with your grant proposal that you've got to submit Thank by <laughs> this evening for, for, for studying your PhD, I think, uh, as we were chatting about before the before the session. Hannes, thank you so much once again. I uh, appreciate awesome. you being Thank on the you, show Peter. Today. I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, and let me know if there's any other questions so I can have that value. So just connect with me and then we'll do that. Hopefully see you soon, Peter. Thanks, Hannes. <laughs> okay. Appreciate that. Cheers, Cheers. everyone. Have a, have a great Keep up weekend. the good work. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.